Governor, thank you so much for joining us. Um, there's some exciting news out of Colorado, actually. It's become one of the first states to pass uh, sweeping police reform legislation earlier this week, including a ban on chokeholds and charges for officers who don't intervene when fellow officers are violating policies. So why was Colorado able to act so quickly? Well, some of it was simply the coincidence that our state legislature happened to be in session uh, during the, the protests and the murder of George Floyd. Uh, they had taken some time away from session for COVID and they just returned. And so they were a, we were able to craft with them a very quick response. And we had wonderful legislative leaders in the uh, Black Caucus and Latinx Caucus, uh, Representative Leslie Herod, who's uh, the first uh, LGBTQ uh, member, uh, black representative in our state legislature. So really great leaders, right time, right place. And I'm so proud that Colorado was able to make some significant reforms. So when will this be signed into law? I think tomorrow. Okay, if that works quickly, that's great. Do you, do you feel like more legislation is gonna be needed after this? Well, you know, an important thing about the, the protests and Black Lives Matter, it's not, it's not about one thing. It is about systemic racism. Of course, the, what, what, what kicked it off was uh, criminal uh, uh, discriminate, discrimination and, and the and murder of George Floyd. That's what, what kicked us off. But it is about a lot more. It's about educational equity. It's about economic equity, of course. But yes, this will be uh, very exciting at a moment in time to be able to do criminal justice reform and police reform in a meaningful way in Colorado. Now, it also seems like this was a successful bipartisan effort when that hasn't been the case um, in other states and with other governors that we've spoken to. So why do you think you were able to make that happen or the legislature was able to make that happen? Well, it's yeah, it, it passed with widespread Democratic and Republican support. I think everybody really acknowledged the need for police reforms in our state. Uh, every Democrat voted for it. Almost every Republican, just a few voted against it. And, and that's really exciting. I, I think it shows in, in Colorado how we can come together around something that we all identify as a problem, and that's a lack of accountability in our criminal justice system on our police forces. And uh, this bill will, will make it a lot better in our state. Now, I'm sure some of this legislation will attempt to remedy this, but I read um, data that says that Colorado has the fifth highest rate of fatal law enforcement shootings in the nation, and that the number of shootings is actually doubled between 2014 and 2018. So why do you think that the rate is that high and what steps do you think are going to be taken to mitigate that? Yeah, this bill really shows that even before the, the George Floyd uh, murder, this was on our minds here in our state, uh, having witnessed the rise of police involved shootings, uh, the lack of independent investigations in some cases. So this really uh, remedies something that has been a problem in our state. Frankly, it raises the legal threshold for deadly use of force for officers, bans, chokeholds, uh, creates a, a more confident process around how uh, things can be investigated. So it's a, it's a big step in the right direction. But we also know we need a cultural transition uh, in our law enforcement agencies, which in our state, like most areas, are very local. In our state, we elect our sheriffs. Uh, police chiefs are appointed by mayors or city councils. So uh, it's really about bringing along everybody in the cultural transition, but also laying the great state groundwork in law that really protects our civil rights. Can you explain what you mean by raising the legal threshold for use of force? Yeah, so it, it, it changes the parameters around when officers can legally use deadly use of force. Um, some of the police involved killings in our state were legal uh, under the current law, are legal. Uh, though, you know, the criteria for when officers can use deadly force uh, is changed by this bill and the bar is raised and, uh, and that'll factor into the training of our law enforcement officials across our state. Okay, so according to Colorado Public Radio, just I think it was one half of 1% um, of those officer involved shootings that you mentioned in the last six years ended in actual charges against the officer. So this seems like this will apply directly to that situation. Yeah, most of them were legal under our laws, um, including uh, the tragic killing of Devon Bailey, who was a fleeing suspect. Uh, this makes it uh, so that fleeing suspects are, are no longer subject to deadly force use by law enforcement officials. Right, which is something that we just saw in Atlanta with the killing of Richard Brooks as well. I understand the bill also has qualified immunity in it, which is something that activists have been pushing for. Can you explain what qualified immunity means and why that's important when holding police accountable? Yeah, well, of course, uh, what we all care about the most is the criminal responsibility, the officers involved with the 
uh, uh, murder of George Floyd are being held criminally responsible. But civil liability is also important, and that means um, do you have a financial responsibility? There's a difference about how these things are adjudicated in our courts. Um, to be convicted of a criminal offense, it needs to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, what that means is um, it's obviously very clear where there's video and there's 100% evidence. But in many other cases, while a jury might think, oh, the officer probably did it, probably ain't enough. It has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a very high standard. Uh, you know, we, we have a system that uh, gives rights to those accused of crimes. Civil law is very different. It's a preponderance of the evidence, meaning the bulk of the evidence, uh, and then there is financial responsibility for the crime. Well, city councils um, across the state and country are looking at ways to divest from law enforcement and invest in communities elsewhere. Do you think that defunding works? Well, I, we don't have any communities in Colorado that uh, had deliberately taken that tact. We certainly have some that have reconfigured their law enforcement. A small town of Berthet in northern Colorado uh, disbanded their own police department and contracted with the local sheriff to provide law enforcement services. And there are many municipalities who have a choice of agencies. If they don't want to run their own police force, they can contract with a, a local sheriff. Is that something that happened recently in the wake of Floyd's death or something that was already in progress? Uh, the Berthet Police Department was probably three or four years ago, and the issue was they had uh, accusations of uh, favoritism and I think uh, a very small force, you know, 789 officers. I think, uh, you know, someone was uh, sleeping with somebody else and it was a problem and they just disbanded the whole thing. Uh, now, the entire nation is also going through this racial reckoning with our history. Colorado's history includes massacres against Native Americans and, and the KKK in the 1920s having a presence there. So what do you think the future of the state looks like for your residents? Colorado is a very diverse state. We're proud of our diversity. I'm so excited that DACA recipients will be able to continue to be part of our diversity. We have uh, thousands of uh, aspiring Americans that uh, work in all positions. I've even appointed a DACA recipient to a governing board of one of our universities in Colorado. So we are a diverse state. We have newcomers, refugees. Uh, we have folks uh, of Latino heritage who have been in our state since uh, before statehood. Uh, and in fact, the United States came to them in the San Luis Valley in Southern Colorado. So, and the lower, the lower third of our state, of course, used to be part of Mexico before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, uh, shifted that to American territory. So we, we have a diverse heritage in our state. We're proud of our diversity. Colorado for all is really our motto. I understand there is a, a sizable immigrant community in Colorado as well. So how was the DACA ruling received today? Oh, there's great joy in our state. Uh, we have DACA recipients from East Africa, from Latin America, uh, from South America, and they're such an important part of the fabric of what makes Colorado work. And we're just so proud that they uh, don't have to live in day-to-day -day fear of losing their ability to live and work legally in our state and in our country. Well, are there any more state-level actions that you're considering to try and, and help these communities? Uh, well, we uh, already have in-state tuition for uh, folks who aren't documented in our state. Uh, they're all just as we're uh, trying to build uh, bridges of trust between Black Americans and law enforcement. There's the same challenge for different reasons. The immigrant community. Uh, many members of the immigrant community live in fear of law enforcement because they fear cooperation with ICE or federal enforcement agencies. So we really are doing our best to make sure that on civil enforcement matters. Uh, that they don't become subject to ICE deportations or detentions, that we really retain those deportations for criminal matters. Now, switching gears a little bit to another major crisis happening, the pandemic. Um, as of June 18th, bars can reopen in Colorado. Summer camps, overnight summer camps are open. Concerts are, uh, uh, can resume. So this is a big deal in reopening um, that we're seeing uh, as opposed to a lot of the rest of the country. So can you explain this protect your neighbor phase that you're in? Yeah, well, in Colorado, it's it's not the way it was. I mean, there's no large events and there's limited uh, attendance at, for instance, something like concerts and there'll be social distancing. Uh, folks are wearing masks in our state and they're doing a good job so far. People are making responsible choices. Um, and uh, so far, the trend has been down. Really, that will only continue as long as people keep up the right kind of behavior. And that means staying six feet from others, washing your hands regularly, and of course, wearing facial masks when you're in public. So how worried are you about reversing the progress that has been made in fighting COVID-19 as you reopen? 
Well, I worry about it every day. As I said, the, the minute that people aren't wearing masks or are not social distancing, uh, this thing is going to come roaring back. It has in some of our neighboring states, Arizona and Utah. And uh, even when there's outbreaks in our state, we, we strive to contain them early at the site level so they don't become community-wide outbreaks. But it's a, it's a tough health situation. It's going to be with us for months to come until there's a vaccine or cure. And we have to be responsible and make the right choices in our lives. Speaking of your neighboring states like Arizona and Utah, where we are seeing cases rising, what has Colorado done differently um, to avoid these spikes? Well, we're managing this in our state. We were an early hot spot. We uh, really went to a lot of strong precautionary measures. People who work in our stores, our restaurants wear masks. Uh, we encourage uh, anybody to wear a mask in public. In some of our biggest cities, mask wearing is a requirement. I'm supportive of that for those cities that are doing it. Uh, and we're just trying to be smart about it. And it, uh, it's not an easy time for anybody. But the more that we value protecting our own lives, protecting the lives of our loved ones, as well as an economic recovery and economic opportunity, it's important to make the right choices and wear masks when we're out. Now, would you consider making uh, wearing masks a statewide requirement? I saw that Col uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom actually just did that. So we do have a statewide requirement for people who work in retail, grocery stores, clothing stores, people who work in restaurants, uh, people who interface with the public as part of their uh, work, there is a mask a requirement for those folks. Um, we also signed an executive order very similar to Governor Cuomo's that for stores that want to have uh, no mask, uh, no service policies, that those are enforceable in our state. And we encourage uh, many stores to implement those policies that many of our largest retailers have. So as you continue to reopen, if Colorado is able to make it to phase three, I think that's where you can have gatherings of up to 500 people. Would you consider reimposing restrictions if you get to that point and cases have spiked? Well, we're not there yet. Uh, this is a regional approach in our state. Colorado is a big, diverse state, you know, uh, hundreds of miles from one side to the other. There's uh, different outbreaks in different areas. So in areas that have a very low viral count, and strong public health capacity, uh, we think that they can get to gatherings of 500 as soon as early July. Uh, it's certainly possible in those areas that if there are outbreaks, despite them having the testing and the capacity, then they might need to take steps to, uh, to help prevent the further transmission in those areas. So would that come from your office or that would come from potentially county or local officials who would reimpose restrictions? Well, we, we, it's unlikely there'd be an outbreak everywhere all at once. Um, what we're really seeing with this virus, just as different states, different cities at different times, even within a large state like Colorado, uh, you see outbreaks in different areas at different times. And that calls for stricter measures in those areas, uh, but it's not necessarily the time for those measures in areas that continue to have low viral count. I see. That makes sense. Uh, now, tourism is also big in Colorado, and it's also something where the first cases, I think, of COVID-19 there were related to tourism. So are you worried about out-of-staters bringing it back to the state? Uh, we certainly are. The good news is that a lot of our tourism is outdoor tourism, especially in summer and, and, and fall. I mean, most folks are coming to hike and bike, and, and, and there's a lot of great space, a lot of uh, state parks, uh, you know, federal parks and, and county open space. So a lot of room to do that in, which is safer than some things. They're not coming to, you know, pack into venues. They're coming to enjoy our great outdoors, maybe go camping. So uh, it's a good kind of uh, tourism and recreation. But of course, we want to make sure the people that work in our stores and restaurants in Colorado are safe. And that's why they're all wearing masks. Uh, speaking of the outdoors, there is this new project we wanted to talk to you about, Climate Power 2020. And Colorado is one of the states that they're focusing on this year. So what does bold action regarding the climate crisis look like for your state? Well, I ran for governor on a platform of 100% renewable energy by 2040 for Colorado. And I think we're well on our path. We've gotten most of our utilities to the point where they've locked in 80% renewable, 70 to 80% by 2030. And that gives us another decade to get that final 20 to 30%. So we're making a lot of progress. One of the leaders in electric vehicles, uh, we have uh, uh, rebates for electric vehicles. We've adopted electric vehicle standards. Uh, so we're pushing on all fronts for clean air, of course, and, and, and for doing our part on climate. What are the stakes of the election this year when we're talking about uh, meeting these goals? Well, it's incredibly important because uh, having good leadership at the municipal level, the state level is not enough. We as a country can't simply 
uh, forego our leadership role and say, sorry, we're not participating uh, in, in, in dealing with climate change. The world can't do it without America. We need to show moral leadership in this area. Uh, many municipalities and states are already leading the way, but we've got to show leadership as a nation, and that's really what's at stake this November at the ballot box. Colorado is also a pivotal Senate pickup in 2020, potentially. Um, it appears that the front runner, former Governor Hickenlooper, um, his campaign has run into some issues even as, as recently as this week. So what do you think the impact of his recent comments, or rather his recent comments on race, um, as well as some ethics issues, how do you think that's going to affect the primary that's coming up? Well, this is a very important race nationally. If the Democrats are going to have any chance of taking control of the Senate, we have to win in Colorado. Uh, there is a vulnerable Republican uh, incumbent senator, very conservative, sides with Trump all the time. Uh, and this is an opportunity uh, for Colorado voters to really say, look, we want to put our state above party, our state above loyalty to a particular personality. We want to do what's right for Colorado and our country. And, and I'm confident that we'll, we'll do the right thing. So are you are you worried about Democrats prospects uh, for the Senate race or are you feeling confident about it? It's a it's a very purple state here. It's neck and neck. Uh, this last time we when we, we lost our Democratic senator to the current Republican, it was by one or two points uh, in this race, again, is likely to be just a couple points. It's it's really going to be very close. There's a lot of. Uh, uh, folks who really like Trump in our state. There's folks who don't like Trump in our state. And then there's a few in the middle and uh, candidates have to win them over to show that they're the best for our country. Now, there was another landmark ruling from the Supreme Court this week. What was your reaction to seeing that they extended protections um, against discrimination for LGBTQ workers? Very exciting. We we have those protections in our state. Uh, so we, we have a fully inclusive uh, employment non-discrimination, but it was wonderful to see our gay and lesbian and transgender brothers and sisters all over the nation uh, have the extension of protection from discrimination. Just so important in this time and really welcome news to LGBTQ community members as well as their families and loved ones. Uh, you were actually the first um, openly gay man elected governor in the entire United States. So just as a final question, we would love to hear what your message is to people for Pride Month. Happy Pride. Uh, we're not, you know, celebrating it physically together in marches and parades and parties as we usually do. But I know we're going out of our way to reach out virtually uh, to our friends, to, to gather uh, in, in virtual and new ways and find that fellowship that we normally find, knowing that Pride will be back in person, uh, bigger and better in future years when there's a cure or vaccine. Uh, but it's important now to stay safe uh, and celebrate our visibility and pride in new and innovative ways. Governor, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it at a very busy time. Thank you. Have a great day.